on your feet and worship. Glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to glory to God. Can you help me say? Tell the generation from the mountains to the valley. By your spirit. 
needs you might have. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We believe the spirit of the Lord is in this place today. So we can cast our cares on him, knowing that he cares for us. So whatever burdens you're carrying, whatever it is you're facing, it's not too much for God. Whatever burden it is you're carrying or you're facing, it's not too little for God. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Every problem to God is a small problem, but he wants you to come boldly before his throne and ask for whatever it is you need. And if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart.
There's a line in that song that we just sang. It said, all things are being made new. I've surrendered my life to Christ. I'm moving forward. And so it reminds me of something. I was looking at that song last night. And um, as the ushers come forward, I just want to take a moment to explain this, that when the world, when the world uh, is the thing that we surrender to, it tells us that we can, we can accept those people who deserve it. We can love those people who are loving us back. Um, we can give as we feel like it. But when we're surrendered to Jesus, we accept those that he tells us to accept. We love those that he tells us to love. And we give as the Lord tells us. And so my question to you this morning is real simple. What is the Lord telling you to give in obedience to him? Very simple. Lord, I thank you so much that you have assembled a people together in this church that love you, that want to accept and love others and give as, as you um, have instructed them to do. By your spirit, God, would, would we um, hear this morning what that is. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. So I've got two verbal announcements I want to tell you. Youth, if you're in the room, next Sunday, 8.30 a.m., we have Bible study starting up. Up in the loft. So get here at 8.30. We'll have some snacks and drinks. And I just want to let you know we have youth every Sunday night. So we're having youth tonight starting at 5.30, food and hangout time, and we're going to talk together about Jesus. Let's go to those announcement slides this morning. Okay, you might think you know what DNA nights are all about, but here's the deal. We are a brand new WSF. So you need to come out with your family, catch the vision, see what's going on, find out what the new WSF is all about. Get a fresh encounter, a fresh anointing. Come check out what's going on at WS First. For more details, you can visit wsfirst.com slash news. We are growing. We can't fit everyone into our new space. So we have shifted to three service times. 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. Spread the word. Good to see you in the house of God today. I love you. You love me. Let's meet at 8.30. You're amazing. I'm so glad you're here this morning at 8.30. You know what? I'm just going to tell the truth. If anybody's going to heaven at all, it's people that come to church at 8.30 on Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Everybody else is going good places too. I'm just going to say that's good. <laughs> Well, this morning, I want to get in the Word of God real quick. Is anybody ready for the Word of God this morning? I'm so thrilled because today I want to talk about contentment. You know, I was reading a story about King Tut. Remember King Tut? Man, that was a big deal. Like, King Tut discovered, what, 1922, um, his tomb was discovered. And this, this young king, they say he could have become king between 9 and 10 years old. That's pretty sweet. Could you imagine being king at 10? 
That would be awesome. Run the place, man. I'd be like, all the water fountains are Hawaiian punch now. You know, just doing things. But when he passed, it was only 10 years later. So he was yet a young adult, just barely no longer a teenager when he passed away. And here's what they discovered. They discovered the mask that they put on his grave that was covering his mummified face was pure gold. It had lapis lazuli. It, it was beautiful. And his mask today is worth $2 million. He was covered his, his first two. He had four coffins. Coffin within a coffin within a coffin. His first coffin was solid gold, and today that it, it was slightly thin, but it would be worth over $1 million just for his initial coffin with hammered gold on it. His tomb total value, $1 billion, billion. That's a lot of money. And I'm just going to tell you something right now. Um, if I were, God forbid, something to happen to me, I ask that all of you throw all your money in the hole. My casket, you throw your money in, okay? Because here's how we're going to do this. You throw everything you value in that hole, and then my wife's going to come along that night, and she's going to scoop it up and write you a check and throw it in there. That's what she's going to pay for all the things Okay, that's dumb, but it's funny. You know, I was contemplating this message today and, and how we could best talk about being content. The best way to talk about it is to dive in the Word of God. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 says this. Some people, look at your neighbor and say, some people, not these people, but who? may contradict our teaching but these are the wholesome teachings of the lord jesus christ these teachings promote a godly life anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding Ooh. such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words Ooh, i'm preaching already this stirs up arguments ending in jealousy division slander and evil suspicions these people always cause trouble their minds are corrupt, and they have turned their backs on the truth. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. Yet true godliness with contentment in itself is in itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich, uh-oh, here we go. Fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people who? Not us people, but craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Father, this morning, I pray that you transform us. In, by the renewing of our mind in the word of God. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone say amen. amen. You know, on this thought, there's this wonderful book. Um, it really helps this. It, it takes this Bible story and just smacks it in our eyeballs. It was a book written by Roald Dahl. Remember the guy who wrote that book, James and the Giant Peach? He wrote another book, and, and it was adapted into a movie not long ago. Now, hold on. Before everybody runs and grabs this book, I'm just going to tell you up front. This is a children's book. However, the language in the book is from the earlier days, okay? There's certain words and phrases in there that today might not be acceptable. Don't hold it against me, okay? It's a PG-rated message. Mm -hmm. I don't know why the fantastic Mr. Fox didn't win the Academy Award. But bear with me while I guide you through the premise. If you're ready, somebody say, let's go. Above the valley in the woods lived a fox family. Mr. Fox, Mrs. Fox, and four small baby. Mm -hmm. Cute little things. Each night, Mr. Fox would ask his bride, baby, what would you like me to bring you for supper? 
a plump chicken from Farmer Boggess, a duck or goose from Farmer Bunce, or a nice turkey from Farmer Bean. The farmer hated that sly fox, all of them, and, and they went to extraordinary length to try to destroy him and his family. They shot him, but they only got his tattered tail. They dug up his burrow with shovels and even used construction equipment to dig up the entire hillside where Fox and all the other woodland creatures lived. All to soothe their bruised egos for the small bit of food they were losing from the sly fox. Amazingly enough, Fox and friends, <laughs> it's, okay, found their way underground to the farmer's storage units where they would secretly, secretly swipe food and drinks for the rest of their days while the farmers sat in the cold with their shotguns hoping their enemy would appear once more. Why were these three farmers so bent on killing that fox? They had more than enough. Now, I know in today's uh, farming communities and even <laughs> our housing communities, foxes are devastating, okay? But this is a, a, a book about an uh, artificial, fantastic fox who would only took enough to survive. Why would these multimillionaire farmers be worried about one fox? I think these three farmers need to be dug into. I think we need to do an expose and dig into their life and find out what makes them tick. Look at your neighbor and say, some people. So we'll start with Farmer Boggess. He was a chicken farmer who ate three boiled chickens smothered with dumplings every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Mm -hmm. Then we have Farmer Bunce. A duck and goose farmer who ate donuts stuffed with goose liver pate every meal. This dude had digestive issues and a bad temper. <laughs> of course, he's full of gas. All right, Farmer Bean. A turkey and apple farmer who never ate food but drank gallons of hard apple cider that he made from his apple orchard. They say he was more clever than the rest. I'm sure he was just more so convinced of his cleverness. The children used to sing a song. Bog is bunts and bean, one fat, one short, one lean. This terrible bunch was nevertheless. You don't know the song? You know it? I love you. <laughs> these guys in fact let me, let me give you the line the kid said it said these horrible crooks so different in looks were nonetheless equally mean the, the whole story was this these guys had it all but they were mean 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 not us people but mean why were they so mean well, we already know, man, we, we already know that, that the reason they were mean is because they were unsatisfied. It didn't matter how much they had, they wanted more. And it didn't matter what little bit they were losing, they couldn't afford in their mind to lose anything. You ever have a friend who's real selfish, you go to their house and they won't share? How many times you go back to their house? Somebody's like, five, because I didn't have any other friends. <laughs> You know, con contentment is, is one of the keys to a true life of abundance. But we must win our battle with discontentment. Before we can talk about contentment, we've got to talk about the attitudes of these three farmers. First, we start with the attitude of Bogus. Mm -hmm. The attitude of greed and selfishness. This dude had no time to share and no time to serve. All he had time was for himself. You know, it's fascinating that a, a, that attitude has not stopped. That people today still struggle. Not us people, but still have no time to share, no time to serve, but plenty of time to sit on the toilet with their phone and watch animal videos. Amazing. 
Hebrews 13 says this, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. Wow. It's amazing how God speaks to discontentment. How about the attitude of bunts? We talked about Bacchus. What about bunts? His is consumerism and self-harm. Oh, my goodness. I'm about to get. This is going to be fun today. He had the hottest, newest technology and fashions. Oh, I got to have that new purse. Oh, I got to have that new digital device. Uh, I'm going to watch the Internet because they're talking about a new computer they're bringing out, and I don't want to miss this new computer. You need a, you need a loan? What? I'm not going to loan you any money. I'm too busy trying to get the hottest, the latest, the coolest. They also experienced the rat race of acquisition. And future proofing. Bro, did you get that newest? Did you catch that drop? That new shoe that dropped? It's amazing how much money my kids have extorted. When I walk into their bedrooms, and it's a shrine to Malaysia, India, and China, I realize full and well, that if we ever had a need, we've demonstrated that we're willing to give everything else away. Huh. Got to have it. Got to have it. And then once we have it, got to have something else. Got to have that. You know, there's almost never been a time where I got something and I was done. Except a wife. <laughs> Just checking. Aren't you glad your pastor loves his wife instead of yours? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 13 says this. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. You see, God's presence, y'all. God's presence is what stops our desire for presence. Industry, it stops our desire for stuff when we chase his presence over anything else. Here's what it says. God's presence is in your circumstances means he will be there to provide identity, purpose, and a proper prosperity. The greatest prosperity you and I could have is people. That's the prosperity I need. I don't need another pair of shoes, jeans. I don't need to look cute in my little shirt. What I need is for some people in my life. What, what do I need? In my life to know Jesus and serve Jesus with me. I don't need to do this alone with all my stuff piled up in my barns. I want people to know that they are more important to me than any possession I could ever have. Then finally, the attitude of being. A drinker of the cultural Kool-Aid. This is the Fox News person. This is the CNBC person. This is the CNN person. These are the people that they watch online and they stream online. Maybe it's TikTok. Maybe it's Insta. Maybe it's uh, 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 Facebook. Maybe it's MySpace. I just wanted to say that because it's funny. They're on there looking for little details that they can argue about. Little things that they can find, knowledge that puffs up. We waste our talents on vain notions and, as the scripture says, arguments about words and phrases. It's so funny to me, the amazing amount of theologians with no degrees online. It's fascinating. I watch them and I'm like, are you kidding? everything you said was wrong. But it sounds good to us, right? The Bible said, does it ever say this and this about sexuality? No, sometimes things are just assumed. Like, I assume that when I reach out my hand, you're going to shake my hand. You don't need to write about that in the Bible. Put out your hand, and another person will put theirs out, and you will shake them up and down. You, some things are just assumed by culture. Like when my wife said, I do, and I said, I do, I'm glad we did. 
It's just assumed that we're going to keep only to each other. It's just assumed that she doesn't have to have a contract with me every single day I leave my house. It's just assumed. And sometimes the, 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 the orthodoxy of theology can mess us up and pull us out of practicality. Oh, the Bible doesn't say that, that particular little word or phrase. So I'm not going to do any of this. Boy, that sounds so good to our flesh. But anything that makes your flesh happy, I can promise, is probably not good. <laughs> when your flesh is like, yes! I don't have to treat people good. I can have righteous indignation. That's not true. That's not true. That's not in the Bible. Love, 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 love. Hmm. I got to hurry up. The pursuit of the vanity of knowledge started our sin cycle in the first place. Remember Adam and Eve? The, the, the whole thing that started sin in the world was a pursuit of knowledge. It was the chase of information. And as information increases in society, we seem to get further and further from the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. The more we acquire information and knowledge, it seems we get further and further away from contentment and a life of abundance. The more information, it seems like the more sad we get. I, I, I got a stat from my, my pastor, one of my pastor friends last night. He said 30% of people have less than one Less than one, I don't know how you have less than one, but 30% of people have less than one significant conversation a week. But we get more information in one hour than people in 1980 got in a week. So we're so engaged. And, and people get mad. Uh, uh, I'm not preaching against phones. Don't get me twisted. I love my phone. I love my phone. I love looking at my phone in the bathroom. I don't care what you say. Don't look. Stop trying to touch my phone. It's mine. People always want to pick up the phone, but I'm going to tell you something right now. The problem isn't the phone. The problem is how we use it. What is that information for? If the information we're gathering is not helping us love and serve and reach and care for people, then why are we ingesting it? There's entertainment, but then there's information. And if you're getting information, what is that information doing to your spirit? How is it influencing your life? And how is it making you love other people? The reason we've lost communication and connection is because our information is driving a wedge between community. I got to hurry up. I only get 30 minutes in this piece. Mm -hmm. Ever since Adam and Eve, we've been actively pursuing more and more information, causing more and more division. Why? Because we greatly desire. I'm, I'm preaching this first service. I don't get to say this at 1130, okay? Those people are soft. But here I can say it. We greatly desire to stand on our own two feet and declare our independence of God. We're pursuing information that gives us so much empowerment that we think we can do it on our own. Proverbs 1 7 says the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge but fools despise wisdom and discipline the next stage of this discontented life is to engage in discourse over petty differences here's what first Corinthians 8 says about that and talk about people who had petty differences the Corinthians now regarding your question about food that has been offered to idols yes we know that we all have knowledge about this issue I can totally see can you see the apostle writing this I know we all have knowledge about this information but while knowledge makes us feel important what great writing Paul it is love that strengthens the church. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know that much. Woo! Did, did, did you know that was in the Bible? Did you? Let me put my readers back up. Anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. It's so true. It's so true. One thing you learn when you go through university and you go through seminary for me, and I did my doctorate. One thing I learned was this. The more education you get, the more humble you become. Now, there's some people, what people? That do it for all the wrong reasons. They go into education to prove something. I'm, I'm the baddest. I'm the, I'm the big dog. I'm, I'm all that. But here's what, if you have a, a heart that's pure and you're pursuing to grow, here's what happens. You start to study and you realize, man, I'm dumb. Man, I'm foolish. I don't care if you are the greatest 
genius on the face of the earth. Your doctorate covers one sliver of a universe of information. Just one little sliver. That's it. And when someone hits your topic, you're like, <laughs> I've waited 13 years <laughs> for you someone to bring up my topic that I wrote my dissertation. <laughs> I'm so happy because that's how rare it is for the things you and I study to matter. Ask any doctor in the room. They'll tell you. When they get to talk about their tiny wedge of information that we studied intently for a few years it's so rare it's fascinating only an ignorant person thinks they know everything hmm. mm -hmm. but the person who loves God is the one whom God recognizes hold up here's what God said I don't recognize you because of all the knowledge you gathered in this world I'm going to recognize those who choose to love me and love people that's who God wants to honor celebrate and acknowledge you know starting with relationship with God and embracing the love he teaches we can properly apply knowledge appreciate our many differences and spread the message that should be heralded here it is God loves you I love you do you know him? That's the only thing we need to do with all the information. It needs to press us towards that direction. You know, I've learned that contentment begins with our relationship with God and then our submission to his way of life. Hmm. Fully devoted, fully surrendered. All it means is that we're doing all the things that God tells us to do in order to live that life of abundance with contentment. We must be generous. I've learned, church, that generosity is an outgrowth of contentment. Hmm. Generous with what? People got, people got scared just then. You see how it got quiet? Like my pastor would say, your hineys got tight just then. Just scrunched all up, scared. He's going to talk about money. I'm going to talk about time. You know, I learned about generosity and about contentment is when you invest time, when you measure time and you're able to calculate your time and you keep track of your time. If you wear a watch, you actually are not doing it because you're busy. You're doing it because you're measuring. If you're doing it properly, you're measuring time. Time is not money. That's an insult to time. Time is love. What you spend your time doing is what you actually love. How much time have you spent loving people? Measure your time, and if you measure it, then you can give it away. If you never measure it, you never have it. This is what drives me crazy. This is why people say, if you want something done, ask what kind of a person. I can't hear you. A busy person. You know why? Because a busy person keeps track of time. They mark time. They're watching time. They're taking care of time. You know why? Because time is more than money. Time is love, and they don't want to waste love. They want to waste care. They don't want to waste time. And so when you want something done, you ask a busy person. And, and the lazy person, the reason they're, they're considered lazy is because they never measure their time. It, it's not because they're evil. That's not what it, it's, it, it, the scripture alludes to. It alludes to this. They have lost their way. They're lost in time. You ever lost time? You're sitting on your couch watching something. I'll just watch another one. I'll just watch one more. Okay, two more. Okay, it's almost over. I'll just finish it out. Before you know it, the sun went up. The sun went down. Your laundry's not done. Your kids are hungry. Your wife is mad. And I'm in my, I mean, you're in your bed. <laughs> Never got dressed. But man, you saw that whole season. You accomplished something that day. You didn't, you weren't evil. I wasn't evil. I was lost in time. And the key to contentment in our life is never to lose track 
of time. To, to measure your time so that you can give it whenever you want. You can't give what you don't know you're giving. I know the Bible says don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's a figure of speech, okay? God wants you to measure what you give him. He wants you to know what you're giving. He just doesn't want you to show what you're giving. He doesn't want you going, hey, I put the biggest gift I've ever given in the offer today. How much? Man, $200. Wow, I'm the man. He doesn't want you doing that. Okay? But at home, when you're doing your budget, you, you calculate. You measure. In fact, we, as the adage goes for all contractors and every, every seamstress, seamster, tailor in the world, measure twice, cut, no waste. No time is wasted when you measure it twice. This is such a practical message. I would tell everyone in here to get a paper and a digital calendar and measure your time. Spend time planning your time. And the more time you spend planning your time, the less time you'll lose and you'll be able to give. Spiritual enrichment and discipling others are the initial measures of living generously. When you're able to give some of your time away, here's what happens. You stop hoarding time and you start giving time. When you measure time, you give more, not less. Because you realize how much time you have. Man, we have 24 hours Every day. And if you are the greatest sleep monkey on the face of the earth, you're getting 10 hours. There's some people out there that they need nine hours, eight hours. Some of y'all here are like, uh-uh, I don't ever get that. But let's say you, you're really, you need a lot of sleep and you get 10 hours of sleep. You got 14 hours. Okay, I got to go to work. You still got six hours. That's after work. Six hours. Man, I, I, I don't have any time. I, you slept for 10. <laughs> but you don't know that because you don't measure it. You haven't looked at the clock and went, huh, some of us don't even have a clock. Like, there's a new thing like, don't put a clock in your bedroom. Oh, you better put a clock in your bedroom. Because you need to measure time. If you don't measure it, you can't give it. Oh, man, I, I, I just don't have any time. It cracks me up how many people don't have time until they're in trouble. Then they got all the time in the world. Pastor, please come see about my son. My son is going to hell. Can you undo what I did for 14 years in one hour? It's amazing how much you believe in my time, but you don't believe in yours. Just saying, 1130 can't handle this. You're talking with me. You're not just listening to me. How about our talent, man? We got to give our talent too. We got to measure our giftings and generously use them for others. Measure your giftings. Measure your giftings. I can't wait for you to preach up here, Bob, because I want to hear your giftings, your spiritual and, and, and communicatable gifts. I want to hear that. Next week, I'm going to interview Dr. Spencer because he wrote a book. We're going to expose his gift, an expose on his gift. We're going to talk trash about his gift. Now, everybody's showing up next week. It's, gonna be, it's a great book. I can't wait to talk about it next week. It's going to be amazing. Listen, we got to measure our giftings. In other words, we got to know if they're really giftings or not. <laughs> if you can't sing, please stop signing up to sing. In the name of Jesus. Okay? Now, what I mean is this. I have met some of you. What people? who've been in our church for years, and they can sing like a songbird, sitting in the seat. Sorry, selfish suckers. Stop it. You know you have a gift. You've already measured it. You've already determined it. You've already discovered it. You've already deployed it. You've already been discipled in it, and now you're sitting on it. Stop sitting. Serve. Use that gift. Deploy that gift. Some of you are amazing at hugging babies. Why aren't you in that nursery right now? There's some of the cutest babies in the world. Ain't like them ugly babies of the other church. These babies are cute. They ain't got scabies or nothing. Whatever your giftings allow, 
Dude, I got baby magic. I ain't joking. I got baby magic. You hand me a crying baby, that baby gonna stop crying. Why? Because it's scared. I put the fear, <laughs> the fear of God in baby. No, I have baby magic. I hold a baby. Babies love me. I don't know why. I don't get it. Little kids love me. Uh, uh, all of them. Boys love me all the way up through all the ages. Girls, right to about 13. And they're like, yeah, I can live without them. That's been my life, my whole life. It's okay. But we have to measure our gifts and generously use them. Not for ourselves. That's the eight-hour part of your 24-hour day. What are we going to do with the others? So much of what I do every day is for me. I don't brush my teeth for you. I brush my teeth for me. I don't take a shower for you. I take a shower for me. I don't go to the barber for you. Actually, I do because I don't really care. <laughs> but I would go anyway, but not as much. I do it for me. I don't kiss my wife for you. I kiss my lady for, for her because she's blessed. <laughs> Everything I do almost my whole day is about me. What if I planned to use what God has gifted me in to help others? The spiritual application of your giftings is the first measure of living generously. Finally, treasure. Measure your treasures and share them generously. The spiritual use of your treasures is the first measure of living generously. We gotta measure. What we don't measure, we'll never be able to manage. It's amazing how there was a time in my life when I was thought I was so generous, but I was generous for the future. I was like, man, I can't wait till I win lotto. I'm going to hook my church up. I'm going to give them everything they ever needed. I'm going to pour money and resources out. I'm going to give them everything. Or, man, when I get that job, I'm going to really give to the church. I'm going to give to the March of Dimes. I'm going to give to cancer research. Man, you know what? Bro, bro, when I get my next check, my next check, my next check, you know, next time, the next time, I'm going to do something next time. The offering plate goes by, hey, next week, next week, next week. Hey, I'll do this next week. I'm going to be generous next week. The reason you don't have it to give is not because you're evil. Stop putting things in black and white terms. The reason you and I often don't have what we need to give is because we haven't been measuring and managing so that we have a plan to give. When I look at your tithing records and don't think I don't, all I see is mismanagement, not misguided just mismanaged. Just people going, eh, me first. What a great, terrible notion that came from information, the information age. Pay yourself first. <laughs> oh, man, that'll send you straight into bankruptcy. You know who you pay first? Your bills. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you pay people that you owe. You sow into what you want to grow. What do you want to grow? You see, it's different when you talk about paying, but when you talk about sowing, and we're talking about sowing and growing, what are you trying to grow? What are you trying to see increase in your life? What are you trying to see increase in your family? What are you trying to see increase in your, in, your, in, in your life? Those things go first. It's not just you, because I'll even say that some of us, including me, pay my tithe as a bill at times and screw the whole plan up. I've messed this up, y'all. There's a one major thing I've done wrong in generosity, and I wrote it in my notes. I haven't always done it cheerfully. Sometimes I've done it stressed out. Sometimes I've done it as a bill. I'm just paying God off. Yeah, you just keep them, you know, them foxes and snares out of, you know, whatever the Bible says, the birds come steal my stuff. If you can just keep them birds out of my seeds, God, here's your check. It's like I'm trying to pay him. It's like he's the mafia. And I'm trying to pay him off so he doesn't jack me up. Sometimes I've been worse. I've done it without even thinking about it. Like just 
forget that we give. There was one time I felt conviction because I called my wife. I go, babe, are we tithing? She's like, of course we are. I was like, okay, just, I didn't, I didn't measure, I didn't pay attention to the management. I took my eyes off of it. How are you and I going to operate in a spirit of abundance when we don't even know what we have to begin with? Ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is foolishness. Huh. I love that in the first testament of the Bible, <laughs> this is what the Lord says. Stop at the crossroads and look around. Ask for the old godly way. Come on, worship team. Come on up here. And walk in it. Ask for the old godly way and walk in it. Travel its path and you will find rest for your souls. That's so good. That's so good. That if we walk in God's way, if we obey God, rest is the result. Part of that rest in our soul is contentment. Contentment. Multi-millionaires getting big construction equipment to murder one fox and his four kids and his bride. Discontent. So many of us have it all, and we act like we don't. I mean, the American dream, you guys have crushed the American dream. You are so wealthy. Think about it. You... Every single month, you have food, you have shelter, you have a little extra pocket money. Maybe not a lot, but you got it. You got gas in your car. <laughs> Except for Miss Betty, you got air in your tires. You know what I mean? You, you, you're just living the dream. The American dream when we were kids, and I'm not that, I'm 51. Thank you. The American dream when we were kids was to own your home. No matter how, uh, how late it is that you purchased your house, there is a termination date on that loan. And because the banks are so rough, oh, you're going to make it. You're going to make it all the way there if you're renting. There are pathways, bridges from renting to ownership. Amazing. We live in an amazing country. But man, we'll never fully attain until we measure. Here's a little extra hint for those of us that are in financial discord. I used to teach teenagers and young adults finances. And uh, it all started in Miami with teenagers in my youth group that became young adults that became adults. And I said, if you have a, a credit score, what is it? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm 17. I'm 19. I, I don't know what my credit score is. Do I need to worry about that right now? Yeah, you do. The whole world runs on it. It's called integrity. The whole world runs on that integrity principle of the, of the credit score. And, and I would meet people, and they'd be in total chaos financially. And I'd be like, hey, man, hey, sister, um, you know, what's your credit score? I don't know, man, but it's bad. I guarantee it's bad, dude. It's terrible. My life is horrible. It's, oh, my goodness, it's falling apart. I can't pay my bills. So hold on, hold on, stop, 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 stop. Go pull your credit report. And they go pull it, and they start managing it they pull it and they go oh, that's not bad it's not as bad as i thought it was gonna be okay who do you owe money to man so many people oh my goodness i don't know what i, I don't know what to do it's terrible ah. okay hold on hold on hold on hold on get all your mail from last month and bring it over here and we lay it out okay here's who you owe this is how much you owe here's the total that's not that's not that that's not that's really not that bad i know yeah it's never as bad as you think it is. Your brain is way worse than reality. The mind of sinful men. Not women, just men. Not all people. Is <laughs> death, right? I'm just kidding. Women have sinful brains too. If you want to claim that. Once they got to the point where they were measuring, it 
was amazing how the light bulb went off. And all of a sudden they're like, dude, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to own some stuff. I'm going to pay off these credit cards. I'm going to live in abundance. Because you cannot manage what you refuse to measure. And the minute they started measuring it, everything started changing. My young adults became wealthy, prosperous. I go down to Miami and they're ballers now, owning multiple homes, renting and leasing to other people. Why? Because at one point they decided at 16, 17, 18, 22, that I'm going to measure what's going on in my life so that I can be generous, so that I can be fulfilled, so that I can be free. Oh my goodness. There's nothing like being free. Y'all ready to get out of here? Because I'm not. In the New Testament, this is how Jesus described it. He said, come to me. All you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. God wants you to measure your life not according to human standards. You need to have $2.9 million in the bank to retire, but according to his word, an abundant life. Abundant. Oh, man. God wants us to do even more weird stuff. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Wow. When we wait to give the money, we wait until we have the money to give the money. We'll run out of money before we give the money. But I've got to become more joyful. And joyfulness comes out of contentment. And contentment comes out of measuring, managing, and worshiping. Trusting God. He's in charge. And knowing what we're doing for him, knowing what we're not. Don't lie to yourself. Oh, I volunteer all the time. I do this and this all the time. Do you? Pull out that calendar and show us. What, what have you been doing? Your time. That. Your talent. That. Your finances. That. And I can show you a content person that won't look anything like Bogus, Bunts, or being. Can I pray for you? I'm praying for me too. Because I don't want to be a person that gives out of necessity. I don't want to be a person that volunteers out of obligation. I don't want to be a person that, that uses my giftings because if I don't, God will take them away. Because that's not what the Bible says. I want to be a person that knows what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And who it's for. Amen? Amen. If that's you, will you clap and thank God for the word of God today? Now, before we go, is there anybody here who needs an attitude adjustment? Just like me, you walked in here, and, and when I start talking about this stuff, you're like, dude, I need to get this right. I need to change the way I'm doing this. I need God to help me out. And I'm not talking about the attitude adjustment in WWE, because that one's rough. I'm talking about a real attitude adjustment where, you, man, God, change my mind. Make me, renew me, make me new. If that's you, when I count to three, wave at me, because I'm waving too. One, two, three. Wave at me. Yeah, me too. Me too. I want to give the same every time. Joy cheerfully knowing what I'm doing I want to serve not out of obligation I want to serve because I'm in love with people in Jesus I want to use my giftings and talents not to make myself look better but to make God look even better to others Will you pray with me by your heads all over this room? Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters all over this room that, Lord, you would shift our understanding of our identity and purpose today. Lord, make us new from the inside out. Lord, shift us from glorious battle to glorious victory. 
Father, I pray today that you would renew our mind as we have read this word and discovered what you have for us. Father, I pray that we would walk in contentment in the abundant life that expresses itself through generosity of our time, our talent, and our treasure. Father, I pray that we would simply be obedient to what your word says. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Will you take one minute with me and engage generosity again? I want my ushers to come back up here. Maybe you're here and you go, Alan, I wasn't going to give in this offering today because, well, I didn't measure. I didn't measure. Come on up. Or maybe you're like me and you're like, man, my attitude wasn't right and I didn't give. I want to give you another chance. This is a great opportunity. Oh, no, it doesn't affect me. Not my account. Yours. How's God going to see your giving today? On the screen right now, we're going to put our textable giving information. If you'd like to sow, maybe you want to sow into the building program. This is a good chance. Take the offering envelope in front of you. Maybe you committed to that and you didn't measure. Man, time gets away from us, doesn't it? We get lost in time. Let's take this opportunity to invest properly with the right attitude and give to God's kingdom. Father, bless your people. May no, they never again give because of guilt. Never. May we never again give because of obligation. May we give joyfully because you love it when we do that. You brag on us when we do that. Lord, we love you. We give because we love. In Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. Amen. Ushers are coming by right now. While they're doing that, I want to make mention that 1130, we have our, our baptismal service. If you'd like to come to our baptismal service, if you yourself are like, obedience, I need to be obedient to God. The Bible says to be saved and then be baptized. If you're here and you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and you've never been baptized, at 1130, in our 1130 service, we would love to baptize you. And we have information we're going to share with you about baptism. If you'd like to, please come to our 1130 service. You can step right out in that hallway. We will greet you and we will give you information of how we can do a teaching really quick and show you all the way into the tank. And you saw it out in the lobby. Your family, call them. They'll come. Call them this morning and say, hey, I'm going to be baptized today. Why don't you come to the church and come to the 1130 service and we're going to have a great time dunking you for the kingdom of God. I love that. It's my favorite service we do is baptism. Awesome. Can y'all sing? Somebody sing, you make all things new. up right here. I'm going to bless you guys right now. I want you to measure God's goodness in your life. I bless you with the ability to see what God has done and see how you can do it for other people as well. Go love somebody today. Bless them. Measure what God's done and then push it further. Take it further today. So I bless you guys in Jesus' name. Go love somebody. Go love each other. We'll see you out there in the foyer.